Hello and welcome back to the game room. You know what I love? Video games. You know what I love? Talking about games. And it seems like a lot of people these days who cover games seem to hate them. Or at least the people who play them. Well that's not me and that's not the 3,400 and 39 of you beautiful people checking out this video here today. Another great week and another person in the comments asking what do I mean by that intro and I'm always happy to explain it so I probably should make it a little bit broader it's not just people who cover games it's also people who make games uh, I've noticed this going way back I used to be in retail in Silicon Valley and I would come across a lot of people in the games industry who when I'd ask them what do you like or what do you like playing they say I don't play games I don't like games I don't like them and you'll notice that with game journalists, people in development, a lot of people will quote unquote not like gamers, hate the way they are. And when I talk about gamers, I'm talking about console gamers, hardcore gamers, not even really talking about PC for the most part. I'm not a PC gamer. I respect them. I understand why I'm a pleb to them, but I like my ease of use. And it's just one of those things where you time and time again, you just see us get lambasted or this or that or talking bad about the games themselves about what we like and I just that's just not what I'm about I know that's not what you guys are about either that's why you're here and especially the 360 era that's not what it's about though uh, there's a mistake I made this week which we'll get into but enough of that uh, we got another 10 Xbox 360 games to talk about. Now, as I told you guys last week, we are going to be revisiting a few titles because when I originally started doing these videos, I didn't have time to play everything. Well, now I am playing all of them and able to give you some first thoughts on them. In fact, one of the games this week I enjoyed so much, I actually beat the damn thing. So if that sounds interesting to you, let's check it out. There's a lot of games out there some of which you've never even heard of. That's where I come in. My name's Luke. I've been playing games since the age of two, and I have no life. This is my game room. All right, the first game we're talking about this week is one of the more obscure games I'd never heard of until the whole FOMO hit, and it pretty much shot to the moon almost instantly. Luckily, because pricings have come down, I was finally able to pick up this game for a reasonable deal. Got it around $40, I think, $48. It is on the PS3 as well, but I just prefer having things on Xbox 360. And that game is Knight's Contract. Now, this is a surprisingly competent and fun game. It is a third-person action game. You're controlling this big dude with a giant scythe. You lay massive amounts of damage on enemies. I, I don't know why it got so hidden. No one talked about it. I've never really heard about it until I started looking into the FOMO of the games. And even then, back in early March, late February, this game already was up around $100 or just couldn't be found anywhere. Now, it reminds me a little bit of that game Never Dead I spoke of several months ago where your character is immortal and can't die. In fact, the reason you can't die is because you have what is seemingly an, an escort quest for the whole game because you have a witch character that accompanies you that helps augment your abilities and you need to keep protected. Now, while you guys are together, you can unleash all these devastating combos and you even have the option to pick her up and while you're holding her, you heal her and she helps heal you too. Now, if you get defeated, you will fall to your knees and then be a, a, a bit of a damage dealer but can't move. And then you'll die and you have to tap the button to then be resurrected. And then you can get back into the fray. And this game takes place during the Dark Ages. You're an executioner who executes all these witches. And then I guess in a cruel twist of fate, you get cursed, which turns you into this immortal Frankenstein being who cannot die and you end up getting reconnected with the resurrected form of one of those witches and then the two of you get linked and need to go through and take down the evil witches or the evil enemies or you know pretty generic story but very very tight gameplay uh surprisingly tight gameplay and i'm almost thinking 
I want to say this game came out in 2011. It had to have come out around the same time as, say, Skyrim or some big title like that where it just got completely overshadowed. No one knows about this game. No one talks about this game. Like I said, I never heard of it. And it is surprisingly competent, very tight, other than it on the surface appearing to be an, an escort quest for the entirety of the game, when in reality it's not. And it's just got some fun, big, juicy combat, very violent, very over the top. And the fact that you can't die and it does seem reasonably easy to get yourself back. It, I, I can see this being a fun playthrough and one of those ones that is a shame. It's it, it was so expensive. This is another one much like Infernal Hell's Vengeance. If this game looks interesting to you, pick it up now because when these games, when these prices bounce back, when the normal collecting trend catches up to it, this is one of those games that is going to be very sought after because it is a solid title. And it is on PS3 as well, but like I said, I prefer the 360. So that's what we're getting started on. Now, one of the games that I already had talked about but this time I actually put it in and tried it, is Body Count. So I've never played Black on the original PS2, original, <laughs> on PS2 or that generation, but this is supposedly the spiritual successor to it or sequel to it. And putting the game in, what it looks like to me is it's a first-person shooter, but in most first-person shooter campaigns, it's a linear experience where you're going from one end of the level to the next. In this one, you seem to be dropped down almost in an arena. Think like Mario Kart 64. So you have the battle mode where you're in this arena and you traverse backwards and forwards throughout that arena as the level goes on. So as you're playing, new objectives open up in the level and direct you to it to then accomplish those objectives be it you know disabling uh, an electric grid or a bomb or going and taking down some enemies in a certain quadrant and then that opens up and then directs you throughout the rest of the level until you eventually finish it so it's it's almost a it's a it's kind of, I don't know, I, I wouldn't call it an arena, but it feels like you're in a multiplayer map where the whole thing is open and you're just going to different portions of the map backwards and forwards rather than, you know, tr going through a, a straight hallway as would happen in, say, like a Call of Duty campaign or in Lost Planet or something like that. Now, one of the cool things about this game is it does have real damageable environments, though I didn't find that all that great. Anything, it reminded me a lot of that game Secret Service I played last week, where you can tilt the, the skew of your gun, but what it does is it actually, when you start aiming, it locks you in place. So unlike other first-person shooters, usually you can aim down sights and move at the same time. That's kind of the typical Call of Duty first-person shooter. This one, though, has more of a golden eye feel, where when you pop to aim, it locks you in place. So you can only stand and aim, which, as much as I, back in the day, preferred that, I am so trained to not do that that it was a little jarring. So when you're looking down sights, moving left on the right stick will tilt, moving right will tilt, and then moving down will crouch you. So that's a bit of a getting used to. And that those are the uniquenesses of this game as opposed to other first-person shooters. So it feels a little heavier, a little less responsive, but it does have some nice nuance like when you hold and throw a grenade, you can hold on to it for a few extra seconds and then throw it so it blows up instantly, which a lot of games don't have that option. Usually when you pull a grenade, you it doesn't start ticking down that timer until it gets thrown. Uh, but this one does allow you to do that, so it lets you plan those grenade uses a little bit better. But other than that, that's that's about it on this game. It's a solid, it's a solid shooter, well worth the twenty dollars I got it for. I think it's creeping up a little bit more above that, but for twenty dollars, I would still recommend picking that one up as well. Now here was the surprise of the week: another incredible value game, and also a game that when it came out, I just ignored. And it's, it's not uncommon. It actually was the first game in a very popular trilogy. But you'll notice that sometimes, you guys, you just skip things. And this is what I did for this. And that is Tomb Raider 2013. So at this time, when I played Tomb Raider, I played it back in the day on the PS1. So I played Tomb Raider 1, 2, and 3. And I kind of had my fill. At that point, the series got a little 
old. It, just, it didn't really seem to do anything. Yeah, Lara Croft was super hot, but that's about it. And they kind of lambasted, I mean, the Angelina Jolie movies came out. And then they kind of did a reboot back in the PS2 era with Tomb Raider Underground. Then they had Tomb Raider Legacy. And then they rebooted it again with Tomb Raider 2013. But then they made Lara look like a real person. So no more was she that ridiculous Playboy model. Now she looked like, um, you know, still a very attractive woman, but just a lot more realistic. This was supposed to be an origin story, so already... I don't need an origin story, we're going back. So on surface, I understand why I skipped the game, but popping it in, which is a cheap game, I got it for about $5 at a swap meet, and popping it in, it is incredibly responsive, it is very, very fun. It toes that line of kind of the Uncharted series a little bit, but in my opinion, a little bit better, where it has that kind of Metroidvania exploration type, where as you go throughout the game, you get a little bit more powerful, you get new abilities, the ability to go up a, up a rope and use an, a pickaxe to climb walls, and just, it's very smartly crafted, as well as, as a huge fan of the television show Lost, even with the way it ended, I still love the show. The beginning of this game, you crash land on an island, and it is very much, the, now it doesn't, it deviates from being lost, but it feels like the opening of Lost, where you're on the island, things are crazy, you get knocked out, you wake up in a cavern, you gotta escape, and then you're going, you're seeing all this craziness going on, you go down a hatch. This is the game I beat, by the way. I beat this damn thing, I was having so much fun. Because they really humanized Lara in a really nice way. It was She was extremely vulnerable, but also extremely realistic and portrayed well. This feels like a genuine character. She has mentors. She loses people. She needs help. And all in all, a phenomenal experience. And I, after playing this game and beating it, I want to check out the rest of the, I guess they call it the Tomb Raider Survivor Trilogy. So there's Rise of the Tomb Raider and then Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So I'm definitely going to be checking those ones out. But if you guys had skipped that game because it didn't look that interesting or it just seemed like another reboot or just it, it really didn't feel like, it felt, it felt weird for a Tomb Raider game. Yeah, I will say it is a little strange. It doesn't feel like Tomb Raider, but they do justice to the series. Even the way they pull out the double pistols, one of Lara's iconic weapons, is so smartly handled. And you can tell there's a lot of care going into it. A lot of respect for the franchise. And probably my favorite Tomb Raider game now. Like, it is very, very good, and I'd highly recommend checking that one out. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, one of the worst games ever made. I remember when this came out, it got a 2 in Game Informer, and I had never seen a game get a 2. I've really not heard anything else other than, I think Pro Jared did a video on it like 7-8 years ago, which was very funny, and did a good job of covering it, but that is Ride to Hell Retribution. Now, this is a sneakily hard game to find. I actually bought this on the PS3 because I could not find an Xbox 360 copy of it. But then there was DLC, story DLC, that I snatched off the store before it closed down. And since prices started coming down, I'm like, all right, can I maybe find a copy of this? It's floating between $20 and $40. I think I got around $27. But yeah, Ride to Hell Retribution, which funnily enough, my copy came with two manuals. So I got an extra manual. So the manual is like a page. It's one of those ones where it's actually a digital manual. So if you don't have the manual in the game, yeah, it's not complete, but don't be too bummed. But oh my God, this game is so incredibly bad that it's also incredible. And not just bad writing, not just bad story, not just jarring scenes, like actual bad coding. There was one time where I shot a guy and after he got hit, he flew up in the air. Ironically, because it does share so much DNA with another game called Days Gone about bikers, it reminded me a lot of some of the glitches I came across in that. But man, this game, it, it, the driving is terrible. There's glitches. The game froze on me. It's got ridiculous just levels of difficulty. Like the, the enemies... <laughs> they, they can take bullets to the chest forever, but a headshot will slow down and, and take the, take them out. Other than the hockey mask guys, which take forever. I just... And it's kind of open world, but it's kind of not. When you're walking in the wrong direction, the game's like you're going the wrong direction. It turns you around. You, you have to slide under things on the bike, but for some reason... It will just say you failed it even if you go under it. The timings it gives you to get places are very tight. It just, it's so bad that it's 
very fun. Uh, and, th and it's also within reason. Like, unlike, so I played this game right after I played Tomb Raider. So unlike Tomb Raider, which was just a delight for the most part, I think it got a, a, towards the end, I got a little over it, but the spectacle of it was incredible. In Ride to Hell Retribution, it was almost just the, the sure insanity of it all. Like you go from, from just the opening cutscene, your, your, your uncle's like, guys, don't go out. It's dangerous out there. And then five minutes later, your little brother gets his throat slit and then you get shot. And then somehow you're back from the dead. And then you go out to a hotel and you, you, like you, you sleep with everyone. So like just some girls talking to a guy and like yelling at him and you go and beat the crap out of him. And then she's like, Oh, I'm so grateful. But the cutscenes with you doing that, the characters are fully clothed. So it's what, what is going on here? And this happens with everyone like it's such an absolute joke i cannot believe it it's so funny it's so bad it has to be experienced and i believe it is like an eight hour game so it does wear on you so while as much as i was enjoying it do bear in mind that this is not this is not for everyone you have to really appreciate she like it's a they're trying to evoke Rambo in the beginning of the game with you coming back from Vietnam but it's just it's all over the place like they'll do smash cuts that make no sense story that makes no sense the guy's like it's so so bad that it almost just has to be experienced and I am so happy to have it in my collection but I really I got to the point where I was running my head against the wall with um because the checkpoints are not very generous uh, so if you die sometimes you're going back pretty damn far but man, if, if if this game sounds interesting to you, check it out. It is unlike anything you've probably played. You think Bethesda games are bad. You think modern games have bugs. This game has bugs, but in a funny way. So yeah, I, I'd still recommend picking it up if you can. Now, I generally stay away from a lot of racing games. Um, I do really enjoy Excitebat Bike 64, but anytime I've played a motocross type game, I've never really enjoyed it. But this is one that I heard was really sneaky rare. Um, even though it is pretty cheap, you can get it for $10, $15. And that game is MUD. MUD uh, F FIM Motocross World Championship. Which is basically is a big old advertisement for Monster Energy Drink because they're everywhere in this game. But control-wise, it's pretty dang fun. Uh, it has that thing where you can jump up hill or jump up ramps and then you can control your character in midair there's this thing you do called scrubbing where if you hold it long enough and then land it perfectly it gives you a boost there's different characters you can play with in, in a story mode or you can do a tournament mode where you just race all the different races in a row which is something more racing games should have because sometimes it's just fun to r race a circuit and see if you can come in first kind of like strangely enough mario kart has only done this once in Double Dash, where it allows you to race every single race in one tournament, which was awesome. I loved it back then, and it's so strange they never really brought it back. But Mud is fun, and I've been looking at more of these games, this one, Nailed, things like that, and it, it, it's funny because it really doesn't feel like I'm playing a game that could have that came out 12, 15 years ago. It looks great, it looks great on an HD TV, and it's fun to play, controls well. Uh, once again, not my cup of tea. I'm not the biggest racing person in the world, but it is just a fun game to have around, and that could be something fun to play with p other people too, uh, who naturally aren't gravitating to some of these, you know, nerd games that I tend to enjoy that are super hardcore. All right, one of the games that I bought back in the day that I did take a risk on, I want to say it was on sale for twenty dollars, and especially back in 2010, 2011, I was dirt poor so i could not just willy-nilly drop twenty dollars on a waste of time like i do now <laughs> but one of the games i picked up didn't really know much about i think it was between this and dark souls and i picked this one up and i had a great time of it and it has gone on since then that game is dark siders so dark siders originally came out in the 360 ps3 era and it really was sort of a God of War adjacent game, but also utilized a lot of that Ocarina of Time formula uh, in a 3D platformer where you're going around, you get new abilities that unlock more and more of the world. It had a very interesting backstory. You're playing as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In this game, you're playing as war. And when I picked this one up, I want to say Darksiders 2 was in development, though I didn't know about it. 
Uh, I want to say I picked this game up, I beat it, and then immediately Darksiders 2 had a big spread in Game Informer. But I never picked it up. Uh, I got the, the Game with Gold free download version of it, so it is on my 360, but I haven't played that one yet. Maybe that one's coming in a future video, guys. Who knows? But this game has been remastered. It's on modern consoles. It's actually the funny Nintendo Switch case that came with the black case, if you guys remember, very early on, on Switch collecting. So, and that one, of course, has become much more hard to find. But game-wise, solid 3D hack and slash in the, in the vein of, like, Dante's Inferno or God of War. And really, I mean, they spawned five games now, I think? Four or five games? Because I know they had got a Darksiders 1, 2, 3, and then Genesis. So maybe it's four games. But really solid game. A cheap one you can pick up. And I always enjoy playing the games on the consoles that they were designed for. Even if they have been re-released. There's just something about wanting to play those old school, you know, those old school games on the actual system it was designed for. Alright, here's another one that I have covered in the past, but I didn't actually play. And this was one that I was recommended to pick up from viewers last year, I want to say. I can't remember why that was mentioned, and this was really... you think I would have picked up that the 360 had some games I should have looked at back then, because I got this, I want to say for $15, which at the time seemed like a lot. Now I think it's still going for $20, $30, and it's a, a Suda51 game. It is Killer Is Dead. Now, after playing Lollipop Chainsaw and Shadows of the Damned, I definitely say this is probably the third best game on the 360 of them. It's still very, very good. Now, it's it's a lot more stylized. Yeah, back to... I, I talk about Neon White a lot, I guess, but it, it feels like it has that vibe with the characters. The way you have the bratty girl and the seductress and the dude who's, you know, in charge, but maybe kind of evil. And then... Um, it also reminds me a little of Astral Chain, too, because you're playing as a detective who is in charge of uh, basically being an execution squad, and they go and they hunt monsters. So the first level has you going after Alice in Wonderland type uh, imagery, and it's kind of all over the place, visually stunning, uh, has that same frenetic combat that you would see in Lollipop Chainsaw, Shadows of the Damned. You use a sword and you also have a gun that looks like a Mega Man Buster on your left hand, but the sword is far more useful. And there's these cool execute abilities you can do. And it's just really, I mean, also it does have that Suda51 flair at times too, but a solid get, one that I can wholeheartedly recommend, pick it up. I really enjoyed it. And uh, who knows, I know that the other two have gotten remasters. This one, no one talks about it. It's funny, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Not as good as the other two, but a very solid game. And by the time I got to the fifth chapter, I was kind of in the flow of the game. And I, I was appreciating where it was going and looking forward to seeing more and seeing more of the over-the-top monsters and the way the levels behave it just it's it, it's fun it's level based and is a very solid game and i really find that i'm enjoying a lot of what the suda 51 does all right i talked about final fantasy 13 2 the other day i figured i should talk about final fantasy 13 just to have it it's funny i had someone mention to me in the comments what i thought about final fantasy 15 and 16 i actually haven't played 15 but 16 is probably my favorite game in the final fantasy series since final fantasy 8 and yes, I have played 9. And the reason for that is I like the way... Yeah, I, I've accepted they've gone away from turn-based combat. At that point, yeah, it plays more like a Devil May Cry game. But I thought at least the combat was exceptionally fun. And they really at least honored the visuals and the thematics of Final Fantasy. Especially the summons. Which was the big thing that sold me on Final Fantasy 7 back in the day anyways. And then being able to see the summons fight in these kaiju battles was incredible. But anyways, that's not... We're talking about Final Fantasy 13. And it's funny, I feel like I was convinced to dislike this game based on what I read about it, even though at the time when I was playing it, I was enjoying it. But it almost felt like, wow, everyone says this game is terrible. Oh yeah, this game is terrible. So maybe, I mean, if it was now, I'd probably stick to my guns a little bit more, but I was, what, 22, 24 back then? So I didn't have as much conviction, I guess. I enjoyed playing it. I liked it more than 11, or not 11, I liked it more than 12, and I liked it more than 9, or at least I got farther in it, but I did just quit it. I just up and put it down and never went back to it. I found the combat better than 12, but having the gambit, or not even the gambit system, just having the lock-in system where you use the points and it does the battle, the, the fight for you. Yeah, it's not as good, but at this point, 
it's just one of those things where I, I wanted to have in the collection. I'd recommend you guys picking it up too. Just like I'd say, get all three of them just because they are, I, I really do have the feeling that they, they are aging better as we get further along from it than, uh, than, than we thought at the time. All right, and the last game this week that I am revisiting, I have one more after this, but the last game I'm revisiting is a RPG that is exclusive to the system. It's one of the trilogy of RPGs that is, and that game is Infinite Undiscovery. So I originally, when I talked about it, I had said how it had variances in what could happen, which I then actually playing it, discovered how that works. So for instance, when you get in there, let's say you can sneak through a prison and not raise the alarm or you raise the alarm. Well, if the alarm is raised, once you get to the top floor, the guards will go then alert a giant ogre, hey, track that person down. However, if you don't raise the alarm, once you get to the top floor, you sneak up the stairs and then you get a different cutscene where the guard sees you and then goes and gets the ogre and says, hey, this person is here. And it's as simple as that sounds, even though it's not the big world building changes that are promised in something like Mass Effect. To be honest, I think that level of nuance is more interesting to me than the other one. Because in doing it this way, then you actually can have a more meaningful playthrough difference. Because what tends to happen in a lot of Mass Effect games is that you make these decisions... And then it just happens the same way anyways. Versus in this game, it's not pretending that the decisions that are happening are going to change things permanently. Instead, if you raise the alarm, then you get one cutscene. Versus if you don't raise the alarm, then you get another cutscene. And not knowing that when you're playing it, but then if you die and go back and get the other one and get a different variance of it is exceptionally satisfying. And I have a feeling that's the way the whole game's going to work. Now, the combat kind of threw me through a loop. They really throw everything at you, which I think is part of the reason why some of these 360 RPGs didn't do as well, because I noticed the same thing happened in Last Remnant, same kind of thing happened in Record of Agris War. I don't know what it is. It's like they, they want you to know how to do everything immediately versus just throwing you in and allowing you to kind of do that simple, that simple like hit X to attack until you have to use some of the more advanced abilities like you do in say ps1 rpgs that it really throws you through a loop and that's kind of the, the nature of action rpgs anyways if you're trying to make it different than just a straight up hack and slash then you're gonna have to learn all of these new button prompts but giving me 17 different slides i have to read at the beginning of the game when i just want to get and start feeling how it plays is arduous especially because I guess, I mean, we're talking about this is a scenario just for me, but also I don't know if I want to, I mean, if I was a player, I don't know if I want to dedicate that much time. But what happens is you seem to auto-target things that are in front of you, and you can do a regular attack or you can do a special attack. You can hold the R button to then connect with an ally, and then it allows you to use some of their abilities, but in order to use items, you have to pause it, and it tells you early on the ogre is going to, like, one-shot you. You can't damage it, but then the ogre gets... And then you get into, like, it seems very difficult. Running away from the prison, you have dogs chasing you, you have guards chasing you, and if you stop for a second, you're just gone. Then the ogres start chasing you, too. I don't know. I don't know if it's just a really hard starting point, but I just, I mean, I got through it, but it felt a little bit like I had to exploit the game to get through it. But still, fun. One that I would like to put more time into, especially because it's made by Triace, the, the Star Ocean people. And it's not like Star Ocean, but it definitely has some of the DNA of the combat um, as far as the way it works a little bit. Which I've enjoyed and I, I, I look forward to seeing more of it. And then the last game we're talking about this week is one that I got hoodwinked on, guys. So, I saw this is a version that came with all the DLC and I should have checked to make sure that DLC was on the disc. Turns out it was not. It's got a really nice cover with Jill Valentine on it, but that's about it. And that's Resident Evil 5 Gold Edition. So it's funny. Resident Evil 5 is actually a really fun game. I don't understand. Uh, it gets a lot of hate. I thought it was a pretty decent uh, game back in the day. You know, punching the boulder, all that is, is over the top and obnoxious. 
but I don't think people really started hating on Resident Evil 5 until Resident Evil 6. I mean, it started, still started to sink in that they really did diverge so much from the original Resident Evils. As far as a co-op experience goes, it's fun. And even as not a co-op experience, Shiv is a pretty nice AI partner. It worked out well. It was nice being able to switch items back and forth between the two of them. The reason why I talked about Gold Edition is that this comes with all the DLC, so the Mercenaries campaign, Jill's extra thing. All of that is included, but it's not on the disc. Instead, it's on a little sheet. And apparently that sheet only is active for about three to six months after the game has been purchased. So even if this thing, even if the Xbox Marketplace wasn't shut down, this code would effectively be worthless. So I now have two copies of Resident Evil 5, although ironically Resident Evil 5 for 360 is a game that I didn't buy, which is a long story. I'll tell you about that one some other time. But yeah, uh... It's still a decent enough game to pick up. It's been re-released everywhere. I'm sure the gold edition of it has the DLC on the disc if you get it on like the PS4 or whatever. But once again, talking about 360 and just another solid game you could have in your collection. But yeah, sometimes you make mistakes. And I, I managed not to with Assassin's Creed, the America's Collection, not having the DLC or not having the, the third Assassin's Creed game on disc. But yeah, made a mistake on this. What are you going to do? But anyways, that's it for this week, guys. There are another 10 games on the Xbox 360. Thank you all so much again for another banger week. Uh, like, I try and let you guys know, I read all the comments. I can't respond to all the comments because for some reason it seems to hurt me in the algorithm. Uh, but as you'll see, I, I try to address some of those questions. So by all means, leave questions, comments. Say all that, you know, be respectful to each other. But I, and then every once in a while I will comment a few to that. I just, I've noticed that if I, if I talk in my own name, <laughs> my YouTube section, it's bad. But anyways, uh, as a reminder, I release a new video every Tuesday. It's been so nice getting a hold of you. Take care.